Good afternoon. I realize we're on the slow march to lunch, and so I appreciate you hanging around for my talk. Uh, I'll make it worth your while, I promise. Um, about 12 years ago, I walked into uh, Randy Hammond's office at the University of Georgia, and uh, I kind of half-jokingly said, you know, this lutein and zeaxanthin business, uh, we might need to find something different eventually as vision scientists to study, and, uh, because I think it might run out of gas. And, uh, you know, of course, that was uh, misguided, that insight. But he, as I recall, half-jokingly agreed with me. Uh, but, you know, here we are. Uh, I'm going to be talking to you as a vision scientist, but more broadly speaking, an experimental psychologist, uh, about the relationship between macular carotenoids, relationships first with psychological stress, general health status, and then also uh, I'm going to discuss a, an intervention uh, supplementation trial and the effects on stress and health as well. Okay, so a little bit of a left turn. Uh, hang in there. Uh, yeah, well, okay, this, so this is me. Um, official business first. Uh, I'm going to describe a couple of uh, experiments here, a couple of studies uh, funded by Fight for Sight and Omni Active, respectively. Uh, Fight for Sight funded this cross sectional study uh, a couple of years ago, roughly now, and uh, Omni Active funded the, uh, the, the intervention trial. All right, so they also thankfully provided the supplements uh, for, the, for the trial and placebo. All right, the big idea. I'm going to give you a little background here. So the brain is the most complex structure in the known universe. Really, it is, and we all have one. Although, uh, I would beg to differ with a few of my students. Uh, there, there might be uh, some issues there, but okay. So it stands to reason then, of course, that uh, the brain is the most complex organ in the human body. And so it was suggested, first in 1984, but formalized in 2012 here by Benton, that if there were any kind of subclinical nutrient deficiency, again, in an over, overall otherwise healthy individual, uh, if there's a deficiency, then it's going to manifest first as some sort of psychological effect. <laughs> That's a little nutrient deficiency there uh, barking at me. All right, it's going to manifest first as some kind of psychological brain malfunction. So. And, and this idea has been vetted and shown, uh, among others, by Goodwin, 1983, uh, 1997, for cognition. Try and make myself less of an antenna. Uh, maybe I'll get down here where Julie was. Just kidding. Mood as well. Okay, so, you know, there's been a lot of work on. Uh, you know, depression in particular and nutrition status. And again, this is, you know, for supplementation with vitamins and minerals. I, I may, yeah. uh-oh, the dreaded iPhone. I apologize for that. Okay. Also, and, and of course, we're very familiar with dementia and Alzheimer's with regard to uh, carotenoid supplementation, and, and that we're going to hear a lot about that uh, in the next uh, day or two. Certainly. And indeed, there have been some effects, particularly with uh, B vitamin uh, complex supplementation for these different factors, mood and cognition. What about psychological stress? So you all presumably experience psychological stress, uh, maybe on a daily basis. I would hope so. It's part of being a human being. Uh, well, there have been a few studies that have addressed this. And a meta-analysis, in fact, and this is, again, in terms of just general uh, vitamin and nutrient mineral supplementation on a daily basis. There's a general trend of a reduced stress and improved mood in folks who supplement with vitamins and minerals. Okay, it's not significant, general trend. All right. Again, otherwise healthy people, subclinical population. Very recently, El Ansari et al. Uh, did a study on about 3,800 UK students. Just broad brush survey uh, addressing the, uh, the intake of, of healthy foods, junk food, it run the gamut across you know, all different kinds of food groups. And they find that you know, healthy foods, students, again, this is a college age population, that uh, if you consume healthy foods, fruits and vegetables, okay, it's related significantly to lower stress, okay, improved mood. Junk food, 
improved with higher, uh, is, is correlated with higher stress, okay? Chicken or the egg there, right? A lot of us probably or maybe can relate to being stressed out and then eating something, high carb, you know, grab a half a gallon of ice cream, start eating it. I mean, I'm American, so this is what we do. <laughs> this is pretty cool. Have you guys seen this? Natural, just down the road in London? Intact central nervous system. Highly recommend that. All right, so stress. <laughs> I'm not gonna ask for a show of hands uh, for how many people have experienced this, uh, but yeah, let's, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'll admit it, uh, once or twice. Uh, this is sort of the face of stress. We know what stress is. Stock definition, uh, of course, we're really talking about a perturbation uh, from the environment or purely internal, psychological, that throws uh, an organism out of balance. All right, it exceeds the regulatory capacity of the organism. All right, so stock definition here. Uh, chronic psychological stress, fairly well known by now, uh, associated with many deleterious health consequences. All right, cardiovascular disease, this goes back to Friedman and Rosenman, the type A personality, 1959. All right, more recently and carefully done by Rosansky et al. in 99. Uh, depression, higher stress, greater de depression, uh, impaired prefrontal cortex function, cognitive capacity with stress is, is impaired. Again, this is primarily chronic stress, you know, prolonged periods of higher stress, uh, compromised immune system function, all right? And Toss, of course, spoke about inflammation. Higher stress levels lead to systemic inflammation, significantly higher levels. That's not healthy, partly responsible for the formation of atherosclerotic plaques and cardiovascular disease. So it's all related. All right, so also pathogenic processes involved in cancer, development of cancer. All right, DNA repair, cellular aging. Ah, so this, all, this is all very worrisome, right? And so now I'm stressing about stress. Yikes. And so then you end up here, wide awake at five in the morning. And of course, sleep deprivation is a stressor. All right. Wait a minute, this is a carotenoid conference. <laughs> Let's get back to carotenoids here. All right, so where do you find research subjects uh, for, for a study on stress? Well, just ask anybody, right? But we actually happen to have some captive ones, students uh, at, at the University of Georgia. Actually, an excellent uh, range of stress uh, levels in these students. Really quite high, which is beneficial for a study on stress to see what's going with this stress, right? All right, so the first study, cross-sectional, relationships between stress, health, and the carotenoids, macular pigment, optical density. And this was just a single visit. And we had a couple questionnaires, had 151 subjects. The breakdown, this took a lot of doing because now we're at about a 70 to 30 ratio, females to males at our university, and I think the trend is similar in other universities. So to get up towards 90, 60 is pretty good. Again, college age, 18 to 25 years old. Macular pigment optical density me measured by a customized heterochromatic flicker photometry. Uh, we used, as you'll see in the figures, the uh, 30 minute. And, and I agree with standardization. Uh, for now, I suppose we've been using this 30 minute locus as the standard. Um, there may be a new improved version of that coming soon. Psychological stress, a nine question uh, psychological stress measure, questionnaire, Lemire and Tessier in 2003. Health status was, was, was assessed with the suboptimal health status questionnaire. It's a 25 question uh, questionnaire developed by uh, Jan in 2009. All right, graphs. So this is psychological stress as assessed again by the questionnaire. On the Y, macular pigment optical density, 30 minute locus on the X, and we see the 151 subjects spread out. The line of best fit, significant correlation. All right, so as macular pigment is high, and we thankfully had a fairly wide range of macular pigment levels, um, sometimes you run into restriction of range uh, for a homogeneous population, but we happen to have a pretty wide range from roughly zero out to just over a full log unit. All right, so we have this nice, you know, significant correlation. Uh, 
there is a lot more than macular pigment that accounts for stress, okay? I get that. But nevertheless, we get this significant association. How about health status? Now, this suboptimal health status questionnaire is a characterization of suboptimal health symptoms. So the higher you are, it's not the healthier you are, but the more negative suboptimal symptoms that you have, okay? So don't be confused by this relationship. This is actually the more macular pigment you have, the fewer negative symptoms, all right? So again, very similar correlation, about 0.38, significant. Now, this relationship I alluded to earlier with regard to stress and health, how does it play out in our population here? Well, it's a weak relative to the other correlations, but nevertheless significant correlations between health and stress. So, in other words, uh, you've got higher stress, more suboptimal health symptoms. Okay, so you're generally in poorer health. And again, this is in a, I remind you, healthy student population, all right? This is just symptoms like how often do you develop a cough, okay? These kinds of things, these symptoms, how often do you get a cold per every three months, okay? So even at uh, subclinical levels, we've got a lot of variation in actual health, these symptoms. All right, study two, excitement. We're gonna see if we can find some change here. All right, so we did an intervention uh, potential effects of this intervention on health and psychological stress. Obviously, a within subject study. 27 subjects, double blind placebo controlled trial, 12 weeks, about three months in duration, uh, fasting blood draws at baseline every two weeks. All right, so we starved our subjects and poked them with needles every two weeks. You guys, you guys still awake? Okay, good. Measures, we measured, there we go, macular pigment every two weeks, okay, again, using heterochromatic flicker photometry, baseline in every two weeks through week 12. Uh, we got the output of the hypothalamic uh, pituitary adrenal axis, the stress axis, HPA. If you're not familiar with this, the defector hormone the final product of the HPA axis is cortisol, and you can measure it in, in saliva. It's generally more stable in blood. We got it uh, via uh, enzyme-linked uh, immunosorbent assay, ELISA, all right? And this was at baseline and the, at the final visit, so before and after. Uh, we measured lutein and zeaxanthin and serum uh, via HPLC, and that was every two weeks to track absorption with some fine resolution. We assessed psychological stress and health status, again, with the same questionnaires at the baseline and final visits. So a baseline in 12 weeks. Subjects were randomly assigned to four groups, a six milligram per group, uh, per, I'm sorry, milligram per day group, and this contained 6.18 milligrams of lutein uh, roughly, the zeaxanthin isomers, meso and zeaxanthin, roughly half and half, okay? There was some variability around that, but again, roughly half and half between the two. Same thing for 10, you see the breakdown here, and then we also had a relatively high dose of 20, uh, roughly 25, 26 milligrams overall. And then, of course, placebo. First thing I uh, want to show is just the serum response. And this is uh, a little busy. I'll go over it here. We've got the different groups, supplement groups, and the time. Baseline, obviously zero here, out through 12 weeks every two weeks. And so we found a, a nice robust response in the blood for all dose levels, with the exception of placebo, of course, which is kind of what you want to see as a researcher, right? Um, and a point on this. There are students, and I think many among us probably, or you know people certainly, that swear up and down that they eat vegetables all the time, every day. That's all they eat. <laughs> and this is where they are when we get their baseline measures, okay, and serum. So I'm like, hmm, what's going on with that? The highest person, the highest, 
and indeed she had a pretty good diet as far as I could tell, was somewhere around 0.6, all right, for the baseline measure. So even a supplement of six milligrams, roughly maybe seven, including the zeaxanthin isomers, uh, had a really strong response here, you know, uh, nearly quadrupling in the beginning of lutein concentration in, in serum. <coughs> so how about the isomers, zeaxanthin isomers? Um, similar pattern, all right, roughly six-fold less than the lutein. Of course, the scales roughly equivalently to the supplement amount, okay, the amount of the, the isomers found in the supplement. All right, baseline, I'm sorry, placebo remained eh, fairly stable, uh, six, 10, and 20 milligram responses. Okay, so what happened in terms of psychological stress? This was the take home message here, the take home point. Uh, this is the black squares, all the supplementers in the, in the trial versus placebo, the reddish orange circles here. And the placebos actually started slightly lower in terms of stress as it played out. And they went up slightly, but basically stayed the same over the trial. The supplementers, all supplementers con considered together. And, and by the way, the 20 milligram group approached significance with this regard, but because of the low N, uh, statistical power was pretty weak, and so the p-value was around 0.18, something like that. You consider all of them together, and of course you develop a little more power, fairly small trial to begin with, uh, you get a significant drop in stress. And, and significant, this is five or six points on that scale, and so that's, it, it's meaningful, all right? And this is a t-test, obviously. Blood cortisol. So this is kind of the uh, acid test for stress. If it's causing stress, if there is stress in your life, you're going to have more cortisol in saliva in the blood. All right? And so we assessed cortisol, of course, and this is, this is at baseline. Uh, this is the psychological stress measure and blood cortisol, the relationship here. And so this was a bit of a relief, knowing that we were you know, getting some face validity here, getting a nice response relationship anyway between cortisol and psychological stress as assessed by our, our uh, measurement instrument. Okay, but if you look at this more closely, uh, to me anyway, and I fit it with a second order polynomial here, uh, it, it's more curvilinear. And so as stress goes up, it, this may speak to stress <coughs> resilience where you can tolerate for a while stress and then at some point you break. Okay, and whew, there you go. Cortisol shoots way up uh, for whatever reason, and you experienced you know, pretty serious stress. So it may be a little more complicated uh, than just this straight linear relationship that I show here. So just keep that in mind. It's, it's complex. This is sort of exploratory. All right, uh, serum cortisol before and after. We showed before that stress, as assessed by the questionnaire, went down. How about cortisol? Well, as it turns out, it's a very similar pattern. Right, again, supplementers considered on the whole uh, came down significantly in terms of serum cortisol concentration. Right. Uh, the placebos actually showed, again, this slight increase in cortisol over the, over the trial. Right, again, t-test, significant. Health. Now, this may have been a, a slight seasonal um, effect. We came out of the spring into the summer. Generally speaking, people are a, a little more healthy coming into the summer. We saw that in placebos. They came down slightly, which means the number of negative health symptoms went down. It was reduced, so they got maybe a little healthier, uh, but not as big an improvement as you see with the supplementers, again. so. Uh, you know, and this difference here is statistically significant over the 12 week study period. So just over three months seeing these effects. Macular pigment, all right, this is kind of, you know, my classical wheelhouse here. Uh, a little bit busy, I apologize, but we've got all the groups here 
placebo 6, 10, and 20 milligram per day as a function of the weeks in the study. Again, we got a baseline in every two weeks. Uh, we see a pretty robust response. I show four weeks first because that's the sort of right about a month is when typically you see maybe a little bit of change, start to finally incorporate it into the retina. And so two weeks was basically no, no change yet. Uh, and then the march on up, uh, 10 milligrams sort of took the lead in the, in the beginning and then sort of leveled off. This may be some, you know, just among subject effects uh, with regard to uptake, you know, the kinetics there. But overall, you, as you might expect, the 20 responded more favorably than the 10 than the 6, but they all did quite well, talking about a, you know, roughly a point one log unit increase even in the six milligram group over the study period, just a uh, roughly three month period. All right, feast your eyes on this. This is a, a little busy, I'll step you through it here. Again, all of the groups denoted here by the various symbols. Um, I've got a best fit line to the data. This is the change in cortisol baseline minus the 12 week period, uh, or 12 week visit I should say. And so if your cortisol went down, then you would have a positive um, a change, or I'm sorry, yes, okay, that would be it. And then the change in macular pigment over the, the study period, all right. And so what we've got here is the placebo group, black squares, uh, hanging around these lines, this is cross hatches, the zero lines, okay? So if you, they may have gone up very slightly in macular pigment. Uh, the one here that seemed to very slightly, uh, cortisol came down, all right? And then we've got the various six milligram, a lot of spread here, but generally the trend is if your macular pigment went up, your level of cortisol came down down, all right? Now, importantly, there's no direct relationship here, you might be wondering, with serum response, what's in the blood? And so we didn't find a serum response equivalent to this, just with macular pigment after it's deposited in neural tissue, all right? So, conclusions. Uh, Greater accumulation of macular carotenoids as macular pigment uh, related to lower psychological stress and fewer symptoms of suboptimal health. We saw that in the cross-sectional study. Uh, supplementation with lutein and zeaxanthin over three months can significantly reduce psychological stress, cortisol, all right, and then also improve, reduce the number of um, suboptimal health symptoms. Again, blood cortisol, typically elevated during periods of stress, is reduced after supplementation with these carotenoids for three months. All right. The serum response is not directly related. Again, I just showed the figure. Macular pigment, however, is. All right. This suggests that the mechanism appears to involve uh, the deposition of carotenoids in neural tissue. And again, what I'm getting at with neural tissue is this relationship between you know, macular pigment and deposition of carotenoids in the brain. So this is where it all flows out of, right, the brain. So this is probably the case. Uh, limitations, sample size relatively small uh, for a supplementation trial. Um, nevertheless, statistical significance. Uh, what we'd like to do is uh, larger, more diverse, potentially the age could play a role as well. You know, where we benefit by, you know, from low variability in our tightly controlled situation with age group at, at a college, uh, you might miss out on, on effects of age. All right, also, maybe a longer time span for supplementation. Uh, do these acute effects persist, or is there a new set point that comes into play? Uh, we're, we're addressing all of these, and, and also controlling for physical exercise, a, a well-known mitigator of, of psychological stress. So we're looking to do that, too. Currently, we have a large, larger scale um, trial going on right now. So we're addressing all of these issues. All right. So thanks for your attention. Uh, and thanks to these folks who have helped us out along the way. All right. <laughs>
I think we have time for several questions. We can go right through lunch. Okay. Ha, let's not do that. Make you stress. Yeah, don't stress me out, John. Lisa. Jim, these are cool data. I, I'm going to ask you to do something that you're probably not comfortable doing, which is speculating for a minute. Okay. So one thing that's really well known in the behavioral medicine literature is that if you empower people to feel like they're taking care of their health, stress drops, mm -hmm. especially after, say, a flu season, you know, or in, in the students' cases, exams are done and they know that they have poor self-care during those times. Yeah. So if you, when you empower people to sort of feel that way, stress can really drop. Do you think that it's, do you think there's a mechanism for what you found or do you think it's that sort of self-care, you know, kind of empowerment? Yeah, possibly uh, self-care may be the mm -hmm. control issue, like I've got control. That's, a, that's an excellent way to cope with stress is get some kind of control. Um, well, in terms of like, are you speaking about the, the supplement? Maybe they feel like they're taking lutein and, feed, and it's going to help or something? Or is it yeah, more? Yeah, I mean, I, I, so one thing I've noticed in trials is that when people, I, I have a lot of participants sort of start speculating on whether they're on the placebo or the active, and they, sure. they start saying, I, I'm sure I'm taking the real lutein because yeah. I'm feeling better. They say these things, and I'm just wondering if you, if you could think of an actual mechanism for why stress would change, or do you think these other psychosocial factors are doing something. Well, I, I have no doubt that, you know, these other factors play into it. I mean, stress is so multifactorial and, uh, you know, we were really surprised to find this, any relationship, actually. Um, and, and again, I should say that the subjects weren't aware of the, you know, that the scope or the aim of the study in terms of stress. In fact, it was data that was an, in addition to what we were looking at and, uh, and so it kind of came out of left field a little bit. Uh, so. I, I think there, there is a mechanism to it, and I, I think it has, I mean, there's another uh, parallel axis, a stress axis, the, the sympathetic adrenal medullary axis, and it involves uh, generating catecholamines like norepinephrine and dopamine, which play a role in the stress response. And so if you can reduce that, it may provide a mechanism through these feedback loops in the brain. Uh, and Again, I have no idea exactly where, you know, I, c I couldn't make a, a diagram for you if, if, you know, you had a gun to my head, uh, you know, so I'm not sure exactly, but I would have to say it's, it's probably the brain given the macular pigment, the neural tissue deposition relationship, but it's, yeah, it's hard to speculate, but I think it's a mechanism, uh, you know, an actual mechanism and, and not some sort of ancillary effect. David, over here. Uh, Jim. Excuse me. Oh, it's Neil. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I have a question that's <clears throat> kind of in response to one of your conclusions, and I'm going to ask this in general to John and to Paul and other people who are here. You made the comment that the um, carotenoids are coming from the brain into the eye tissue. And, oh. Uh, well, you, I, I guess, isn't that what I interpreted there, that, that it, it's coming from the brain to no. the... Okay, I just, that's what I wanted to clarify because oh, no, no, that wasn't yeah, my understanding, no. and I, I, I was to trying to figure out whether people were assuming that carotenoids are passing through the brain no. to be deposited <laughs> in the eye, and I don't know that there's that no, no. that no, one-on-one no. -on -one relationship there that uh, you know it's in well, the brain. Correlated, the there. ocular levels are correlated with brain yeah. levels, and that certainly Liz's data would show that. Yeah. But I but I think that what Julie was showing, for example, is that. You know, we're individuals. There's a lot of SNPs, there's a lot of changes, there's a lot of things that factor into whether we absorb or we don't absorb. And, you know, I, I recently I've seen a couple of things where it's almost like the implication is if it gets into the brain, it gets into the eye, as if it's going through the brain into the eye. And that's never been my no. understanding. So. It might be similar binding <laughs> proteins and mechanisms, David? but no. David? Um, is it, are you, in fact, having two effects here? One, your lutein is increasing the macular pigment, but could your lutein also be reducing these complement factors, and the complement factors are bringing the cortisol down? Well, it could be mediated. Uh, certainly, there, that relationship could... Uh, lutein, you know, zeaxanthin, doesn't, it doesn't exist in a vacuum, you know, in, in serum, it doesn't have a single effect, doesn't just go to the eye, so... That's a possibility. I mean, the complement factor stuff is very interesting. Um, I know we've spoken about it in terms of, you know, retinal disease. Um, potentially, I mean, 
it's all involved, uh, you know, that this, all of it's related. Stress is certainly uh, this pervasive uh, you know, experience that we have. And so I, it, it's related to so much in the way of disease state, inflammation, you know, particularly related to uh, the, the eye disease and complement factors. So I wonder if, I wonder if TOS can uh, comment on that. Is that possible? Yeah. Um, you, congratulations to your study. You probably also have investigated the visual performance in your participants. Do you have a correlation? Maybe it could be related that if you have a better contrast sen sensitivity that you also feel better and then your psychological stress is reduced? It, we are finding that. You know, I'm the kind of the bright light glare guy you know, from a while ago. And yeah, of course, I'm, I'm doing that as well. Um, and contrast sensitivity, and we are finding improvements uh, in, in those you know, areas as well. Um, how it all, it, it sort of goes together to the point where, you know, I can now measure somebody with my glare device and predict their macular pigment, and then also in some ways predict, you know, their health, and maybe even how they're going to be reacting to a stressful, you know, situation. So, so with less uh, certainty. But. Thank you very much, Jim. I think that concludes our, our morning's uh, session, and I want to thank all of our speakers here who have done a wonderful job presenting their topics, and thank you all for your patience and, and good questions. So, thank you.